So the second component of just war theory is the law once war has begun or once armed conflict is taking place, the use in bellow. Uh, and as I mentioned before, this is also known as international humanitarian law. Right? These two things are synonymous. Uh, or the law of armed conflict. So there's the law of going to war, and then here we have the law within war, within armed conflict. So some of the, uh, some of the doctrines sound familiar, but are subtly different. Uh, the first is military necessity. Uh, so this is perhaps the most interesting portion of use in bellow, because military necessity actually enables states to do things. Uh, and this portion of use in bellow states that uh, a state may do anything uh, in order to end hostilities. So a state may uh, use its military, may engage in hostilities, may use violence, uh, as long as it is related to uh, concluding an armed conflict. Uh, so this actually allows states to do a fair amount of killing and violence, right? Uh, it is per a permissive aspect of use in bellow. Uh, but then uh, military necessity is also constrained by uh, principles of humanity uh, or certain things that would be considered excessive or disproportionate uh, or overly severe uh, uh, and, and too much so to constitute military necessity, right? So military necessity allows states to do a certain number of things, uh, but then humanity, uh, the first principle of constraint, uh, regulates the amount that states, uh, of what states can do. Uh, so generally speaking, within the first principle of constraint, within the principle of humanity, uh, states are meant to prohibit unnecessary suffering. Uh, so torturing uh, prisoners of war uh, or uh, starving prisoners of war, these things would be uh, regulated would be uh, prohibited by the first principle of constraint. Also found here are a number of weapons bans. Uh, so certain types of military technology are illegal under use in bellow. Uh, and that will be the subject of the next slide. Uh, and then we also have uh, distinction, proportionality, and lawful combatants. Uh, so distinction states that in order for, for you to be a lawful combatant under use in bellow, you have to be clearly distinguished as uh, a combatant associated with a lawful military force. So you have to have a state's emblem, you have to be in a uniform, uh, and you have to be clearly distinct from a, the civilian population. Uh, so obviously this is going to be another area of complication with terrorism, because terrorists do not distinguish themselves uh, as uh, militia members, right? They dress like in civilian garb, as if they were a member of the civilian population. Uh, proportionality. So not only must uh, a response to an armed attack in, attack in general uh, be proportional to the original armed attack, uh, but particular military strategies within the context of war uh, have to be proportional to the ends sought by the war. So if you are having uh, a dispute uh, potentially over a small island, right? Uh, if Britain and Argentina were to go to war over the Falkland Islands, uh, it would be disproportionate for Britain uh, to nuke the Argentinian mainland. Uh, but it would not be disproportionate for them to send military uh, armed and armed forces to the Falkland Islands themselves to protect those islands uh, from potentially an Argentinian invasion, right? So within armed conflicts, uh, particular strategies and tactics must be proportional to the ends sought by the states in that armed conflict. Uh, and finally, use in bellow contains guidance uh, to bolster this idea of distinction. Uh, and it also includes combatant immunity. So if you are distinguished as a combatant uh, and not a civilian, uh, and if you are done so correctly with an emblem and a uniform, uh, then you are uh, given uh, immunity from criminal liability, right? So United States military personnel cannot be taken to trial for killing someone in war uh, because they are uh, a lawful combatant. Uh, they are then immune from uh, certain domestic laws, such as those against killing. Uh, and similar, similarly to uh, use ad bellum, the writings of Grotius began the use in bellow, 
Uh, and again, we see particular international conventions legalizing uh, the norms of just war theory, particularly to use in BOO. Okay, so one more note about use in BOO. There are uh, a number of weapons bans uh, that are uh, prohibiting certain types of military technology. Uh, so some of these we've talked about earlier in the semester. Chemical weapons, right? Recall uh, that Syria's use of chemical weapons uh, generated uh, the, the, a discussion at the beginning of the semester uh, and, and resulted in the, the Obama administration cooperating with Russia uh, to go in and remove all of uh, Syria's chemical weapons and to dismantle uh, their means of building more of those weapons. Also biological weapons, uranium, uh, and certain conventional weapons have all been banned uh, over time through a variety of international treaties. So two particular aspects of military technology uh, reappear over time as uh, the reasons why states would ban these things. Um, so one is uh, the severity of the weapon, uh, and particularly the severity of the weapon uh, to cause lasting damage. Uh, so things that uh, would blind individual, individuals, blinding laser weapons. Uh, certain types of explosive materials that would be non-detectable by x-rays. Uh, so if you use, uh, uh, you know, fragmentary grenades that uh, have pieces that are so small that doctors cannot go in, uh, find them, and remove them, that is considered to be uh, an overly severe type of military technology. <clears throat> And then beyond severity, uh, there's also the issue of discrimination. The ability of the military technology to discriminate between citizens and combatants. Uh, so think about chemical weapons, which uh, diffuse through the air once they're used. Right? You can't throw a chemical weapon at a combatant and then ensure that the air does not spread to civilian areas. Uh, similarly, landmines, once they're put into the ground, uh, the landmine does not care if the person that steps on it is a combatant or a civilian. Uh, so there's no discrimination of that technology between uh, who, you know, whether it's uh, harming a civilian or not. Uh, so things of this nature tend to be banned internationally, whereas things that can be aimed, that are precise, uh, and that can be used uh, discriminately by individuals only against combatants uh, tend to be acceptable forms of conventional weapons. Uh, and then beyond weapons, we might also think about mercenaries as something that's uh, a, a military technology in a different sense. Uh, and mercenaries have been, out, out, uh, have been prohibited by international law. Uh, but this, again, is becoming somewhat complicated recently because we have groups like Blackwater, these private security companies uh, that look like mercenary groups uh, but are legal under, under international law. Uh, so the definition of mercenaries and private security companies is subtle enough uh, that it seems like these should not be legal groups, uh, but is also differentiated enough that under international law, they are not illegal. Okay, so even though international law is enshrined in particular treaties, in formal written documents, uh, that doesn't mean that those are the definitive statement of what states are going to do in war, right? States uh, sometimes violate international laws. Uh, just like uh, in domestic politics, laws are sometimes violated. Uh, and in domestic politics, when a law is violated or when two parties are contesting the meaning of a law, we have the Supreme Court uh, or a comparable domestic institution uh, to then tell us what the correct interpretation of the law is. Internationally, uh, there is no clear international organization uh, that has this role uh, of interpreting the law, of definitively saying uh, this state is in violation of the law and this one is not and so on. Uh, so as a result, there are complications. Uh, and certain international laws are not always uh, either strictly adhered to uh, and do not always necessarily stay the same, right? Interpretations change over time uh, 
uh, of what particular written documents are actually saying. Uh, so, for example, uh, legitimate authority under USAD Bellum is meant to be in the United Nations Security Council, but the United States violates this uh, portion of international law in the, uh, in the Iraq War. Other complications, what if a state uh, goes to war illegally, uh, like the United States did in the Iraq War, uh, does the use in Bellum uh, then apply? Uh, in general, the answer is yes, according to most international lawyers and most states. Uh, but, you know, th this is a complicated issue. What if you have uh, a war that is not clearly a war, uh, like Al-Qaeda's attack on America? Should Al-Qaeda be tried under the laws of war, right? Are they even a legitimate body to be tried? Uh, and then what if a state violates jus in bello, like Syria did? Uh, the United States was prepared to invade Syria in order to uphold the ban on chemical weapons. Would this have been a legitimate resort to war? Uh, so does violation of use in bellow then necessitate uh, a legitimate uh, uh, exercise of use ad bellum? So what happens then if a powerful state decides to violate one of these things? The United States in the war on terror, the United States in Iraq, uh, does this mean that the laws of war no longer apply? Does this mean that they are outdated, right? And then who decides if what the United States is doing is actually illegal? United States uh, policymakers say that their actions are legal. Other states policymakers say they are not. Uh, and then the meaning of the laws of war and the United States actions within the laws of war are contested, right? So it's not a, a neat picture of law like we have domestically. Uh, it's a set of regulations that states agree they will abide by, but then there's no international state to make sure they do so. So any questions so far about uh, the basis of international law of war in particular? Okay, so we've talked about international law. Generally speaking, we've talked about the laws of war. Uh, so now I'll say a little bit more specifically about uh, the types of institutions and organizations uh, and treaties that make up the laws of war, where those come, came from. Uh, and then I'll also uh, briefly discuss the differentiation of international humanitarian law or the laws of war with human rights. So the major sources of contemporary international laws of war uh, start with this thing called the Libra Code. Uh, so this was in the late 1800s in the context of the American Civil War. So obviously, just war theory was already around, right? Grotius and Aquinas had already uh, been on the international scene, uh, written their ideas down, uh, and disseminated those ideas uh, for state policymakers to read and to think about. Uh, so a lot of the ideas were already, uh, you know, floating internationally. They were already present. Uh, but this guy, Lieber, uh, who was a father of soldiers in the American Civil War, uh, witnessed uh, the atrocities of the Civil War and lobbied President Lincoln to uh, take these ideas that he called the Lieber Code uh, and make them domestically binding make uh, the United States Armed Forces abide by the Libra Code. Uh, and then uh, President Lincoln liked these ideas so much that he then took them onto the international scene uh, and uh, brought states together under the Hague Convention uh, and got a number of states to approve the Libra Code as an internationally binding set of treaties, set of ideas. Uh, the only problem after the Hague Convention, we have World War I, followed by World War II. Uh, and in those contexts, many of the ideas within the Libra Code are violated. Uh, so there's one step forward and potentially one step back, right? However, after World War II, we get the UN Charter and the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and the Geneva Conventions are the primary source of use in Bello, uh, the, the set of treaties that, that constrains and regulates what states can do within armed conflict. Uh, and as mentioned before, the UN Charter stipulates, uh, first of all, that states are not allowed to start wars, right? It is illegal to start a war. Uh, but then says, uh, however, the Security Council may be 
uh, able to legitimately decide that a war is lawful. Uh, so, for example, there have been cases in Korea, right, when North Korea invaded South Korea. The Security Council said uh, it is legitimate for South Korea to defend itself uh, and for international or, or third-party states to go in on South Korea's behalf and defend South Korea. Uh, there have been uh, instances of armed conflict started by Libya uh, and many other states where the UN Security Council said uh, any resort to war uh, as a result of this action of this uh, you know, violating state is lawful. Uh, and then even more recently, uh, the Rome Statute, uh, which is considered a response to the Rwandan genocide and uh, the conflict in Yugoslavia, uh, added more content to use in bello, more things that uh, would control state behavior within armed conflict. Uh, so these include uh, the crime of genocide, uh, a prohibition on rape, uh, and so on. Uh, so that was in the 1990s. Uh, and then a few other things that I mentioned before, the Kellogg-Bryan Pact, the London Charter. This was uh, the trial of German war criminals after World War II. Uh, and then uh, this thing called the Caroline case. Uh, so uh, very briefly, I'll just mention the Caroline case was uh, the beginning of the idea of immediacy, uh, when a state could declare self-defense uh, uh, related to an immediate threat by another state. Uh, and this was a case between the United States and Great Britain when Great Britain had sent uh, a warship into the territory of the United States. So a question you may have is, how many states actually sign on to these things? How many states actually agree to constrain their behavior in the context of war? Uh, so this is just one example of the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and as you'll see, every single state in the world has approved the Geneva Conventions to some degree. Uh, so the Geneva Conventions is a little bit complicated in the sense that there is a main body, right, the Geneva Conventions, and then there are also additional protocols. Uh, so there's a central text uh, and then a number of additions to that central text. And those things are the protocols. Uh, but every state in the world has approved some facet of this main text and these additional protocols. <clears throat> so once a state violates the laws of war, what happens? How are these things enforced? Obviously, state and non-state actors do not always abide by the laws of war. Syria, for example, uh, Al-Qaeda is a non-state group that has clearly violated uh, the principle of distinction, right? They dress up as civilians. Uh, sometimes they use civilians as human shields by uh, hiding within heavily populated areas. Uh, but what do we do, right? How do we enforce the laws of war once they've been violated? Uh, and then individuals also do not always abide by the laws of war. So a state may sign uh, a treaty or a convention uh, but then how does it ensure that its military personnel uh, then uh, have the correct behavior uh, according to that international law or treaty? Uh, so in instances of violation, uh, states are responsible for making sure that other states and their own citizens uphold these laws. Uh, so particular states, national courts, right, their domestic courts can be used uh, to either negotiate between that state and another uh, or to be used as a third-party neutral site for two states that are in, con uh, are, uh, in conflict over a certain international law. Uh, and then states might also use their own military courts to try their own citizens. Uh, so in the United States, uh, in the United States, we have military doctrine. Uh, and in our military doctrine, we bring in the laws of war, and we make those binding on our military personnel. Uh, so this becomes an issue not just of international law, but of uh, our military's law. The Department of Defense, uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the Army, the Navy, all of these organizations have these military doctrines uh, that make individuals uh, within those organizations beholden to the ideas in the law of war. Uh, so this is interesting in a couple of respects. One. Uh, it shows that the United States uh, is at least somewhat concerned with uh, 
uh, complying with international laws of war because they uh, not only sign on to these things internationally, but then implement them domestically. Uh, and second, those documents then serve as the basis for military tribunals, right? Or, I'm sorry, military trials. <coughs> uh, so uh, you can think about Abu Ghraib, right? The uh, scandal uh, at the prison at Abu Ghraib in the context, context of the Afghanistan war. Uh, the individuals involved in that uh, incident uh, will be tried in military courts and partially tried on the basis of the laws of war. <clears throat> so how do we know when a violation occurs? These organizations here tend to be the types of organizations that bring it into international attention. Uh, so particular states, Sweden and Canada, have kind of taken upon themselves uh, to be the defenders of the laws of war. Uh, but other states also. Uh, and so one state that thinks another state has violated the laws of war uh, by attacking it can be the ones that uh, bring the issue to uh, international attention. OK, so a brief discussion, since we'll be talking about human rights on Wednesday. Uh, international humanitarian law and human rights overlap to a certain extent, but they're also very different. International humanitarian law is made by states to regulate states. Uh, and it also accepts the premise that war is going to happen, that war could happen, uh, and thus uh, that states might need to be violent and to kill people. <clears throat> Human rights, on the other hand, is concerned with protecting individuals against states. Uh, and it's often focused on preventing the types of things we see in war, like violence, like death. Uh, like, uh, uh, you know, particular things that tend to uh, reoccur with war, like rape and genocide and these types of things. Those ideas start with human rights uh, and sometimes infiltrate humanitarian law, but not always, right? Obviously, uh, a human right to life uh, cannot really be upheld in international humanitarian law because it accepts the premise of war and killing. Uh, so while these things overlap, they're also... Uh, based on somewhat contradictory, uh, you know, philosophical or ideational bases. Any questions so far? Okay, so we'll conclude by uh, talking a little bit more about some of the contemporary, con contemporary issues with the law of war. So as I said, the laws of war are meant to were built by states to regulate states. Uh, but counterterrorism is state conflict with non-state armed groups. Uh, so the problem here is that these non-state armed groups uh, are at a distinct disadvantage relative to the states they're trying to fight. Uh, and as a result, they may have an incentive to violate international law uh, to try and lessen uh, that disadvantage. Uh, and then states might feel pressure to, to respond with these violations, uh, with violations of their own. So some of the violations of Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, distinction, right? They dress up as civilians, even though they're combatants. Uh, they use civilians as human shields. They hide in uh, heavily populated areas, right? How do you have a, a proportionate response uh, or a response that uh, removes the possibility of harming civilians uh, if the people you're fighting are in cities and urban areas and uh, these areas that are full of, of non-combatants. Right? And then Al-Qaeda obviously also directly attacks civilians. Right? It bombs populated areas. It sends planes into buildings and so on. Uh, further areas of complication. One I mentioned before, what constitutes an imminent attack? Right? Does the very idea that a terrorist might be planning an attack then allow a state to go into a foreign territory and kill that person? The United States says that it does, right? This is the drone warfare program. This is the legal basis of the drone warfare program. That if you belong to an armed group, the United States can lawfully uh, kill you using a, a, an armed strike from a drone. Uh, but those individuals aren't literally on our border about to attack us. Uh, so the idea of an imminent attack becomes uh, more permissive uh, and uh, is potentially changing. Uh, and, then, and then finally, uh, 
if it's a war on terror and not just a war on al-Qaeda, uh, then when does war end? Right? If uh, Yusad Belm says you have to have a proportionate response, uh, then an everlasting war might not be a proportionate response. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So a couple of issues raised at the beginning of class. Was the killing of Osama bin Laden lawful? Is drone warfare lawful? So a show of hands, who thinks that it was lawful for the United States uh, to go into Pakistan's territory without telling them that they were going to do so uh, and kill Osama bin Laden? Raise your hand if you think that uh, this would be justified under Yusad Belm and Yusin Bello. Nobody. So all of you believe that uh, this was an illegal action. So who wants to offer their, uh, their own opinion, their own reading of international law as to why they think it was illegal for the United States to kill Osama bin Laden? Yeah, go ahead. Definitely want to make the distinction between uh, legal and justified, but uh, as far as use and, and bellow, uh, I mean, not being a state or a state leader himself, um, there was nobody to ask permission, mm -hmm. no matter where he would be. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, I guess it kind of depends on if Pakistan was then being viewed as a third party whose permission was needed mm -hmm. or as a harboring.